The Lord be with you. Well, welcome, especially to uh, Bay Covenant Church and Milwaukee Covenant Church uh, joining us here at Zion as we are together taking this trip through these 40 days of Lent, uh, exploring that theme of 40, because that number is one of those special numbers that gets used all throughout Scripture. Uh, it is sacred. It carries with it some extra meaning. Uh, and as we study the different places that the number 40 occurs, uh, there are certainly some things that we can glean uh, to help us in our own individual journeys, uh, especially as we go through these so-called 40 days of Lent. So Pastor Nancy uh, began this series for us last week talking about 40 days on the mount with God, uh, Moses on Sinai, and 40 days with God produced for him uh, the Torah, the Ten Commands, the Ten Words. And uh, now we want to look at the other side of that story, what happens after those 40 days, what happens as the people of Israel journey towards the promised land, and uh, end up having to spend 40 years in the wilderness. Uh, we often kind of see this, um, this wilderness wanderings period as uh, a form of punishment from God, uh, something that was given to the people of Israel for their disobedience uh, and their failure to enter into the land that God had promised on oath to give to their ancestors. Uh, but what's interesting is when you look at it, not just from the, the earthly human perspective, which is certainly what you can get from the narrative uh, from Exodus through Numbers, but when you look at it from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is at the end of that 40 years of wandering, and it's looking back. Therefore, it seems to give a more heavenly perspective to things. Uh, so this is what Moses says to the people who have made it through those 40 years, who are about to finally enter this land of promise. Our reading today is going to come from Deuteronomy chapter 8, the first 18 verses, but we're going to take it in little chunks. So uh, here's what it says beginning in verse 1. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. So in this first section of this passage, uh, we begin to see how um, God had something very different in mind, something different than what we see from our earthly human perspective. It wasn't punishment per se, but there was a testing that was going on, a testing to see what was truly in the hearts of the people. Uh, Moses notes, look, your, your shoes didn't wear out, your ankles didn't swell, your clothes didn't get old and tattered because that wasn't God's purpose. He was there preserving you. What he really wanted to know was what was really in your heart? Were you really going to keep those commands, that Torah, that he had given you. Uh, so he wanted to humble you, and he wanted you to realize that you are dependent upon him. When you hunger, he was going to provide for your physical needs, but not just for your physical needs. God wants to provide for the whole person. Uh, he wants you to know that he is there to meet your spiritual needs, your spiritual hunger and thirst as well. So you need to depend upon him in all things because he is just like a father who disciplines his son. Uh, and if that word 
discipline is too strong of a word. If it seems like it, it doesn't help you make sense of what is going on, that loving care and provision that God is providing for his people in the wilderness, take the same root of that word and um, change it from discipline to discipling. Um, just like a father disciples his children, uh, that is apparently what God wanted. He wanted to disciple them, to draw them into a deeper relationship, a deeper dependence upon him so that they would continue to understand he is their father and they are his children. We continue on picking up in verse 6. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. Another good thing to remember about what God was doing in those 40 years is that it always meant to end with blessing. He was going to give them that land of promise. What he was doing in those 40 years was preparing them with his word, that his command, his Torah, would help them better live into that land of promise, better live into the blessing that God had for them. So don't miss the fact that he was always leading them through those periods of suffering, through that intense time, uh, to a place of blessing. That was always his end goal. And then this last section, beginning in verse 10, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known, to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember, remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth, and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. You see, what happens uh, when we don't go through a period of preparation is we begin to uh, believe that we deserve everything that we get, that we earn everything that we get, that we produce everything that we get. We forget about God, and therefore uh, we become a little bit more entitled in our thinking. And if I may, uh, this very well might be, to me, one of the, if not the largest struggle of the North American church in our day, is realizing that we are forgetting about God. Uh, we believe that we have earned our right in this society that we have earned our right to do the things that we think we should be able to do as the church. We think that we're entitled to these things. But that is not the point. And I think Lent is here to help remind us that is not the point. As we give things up, as we fast from things, we get to see in this wilderness period what the true desires of our heart are. It should humble us. 
It should remind us that we are dependent upon God for everything, not just those physical things that we give up, whether it's food or drink uh, or some kind of entertainment that we fast from. We aren't dependent upon God just for those things, the enjoyment of those things, but he feeds our very souls. We depend on him for every word that comes from his mouth uh, so that our souls might have life. And this is a time to draw closer to him as our Heavenly Father, to enter into deeper relationship and recognize that he has parental concern for us. So friends, I pray that you have a holy and blessed Lent, and may the peace of God be with you. Amen.